Welcome, everybody. Yes. All right. Well, welcome to this um, virtual masterclass um, from your folks here at West Music. Um, my name is Cindy Culler, and I'm the category manager for um, general classroom and print music products for um, the company. And we are so pleased to welcome Brian Balmages um, with us today. He is an award-winning composer and conductor whose music has been performed throughout the world with commissions ranging from elementary schools to professional orchestras. And as a conductor, he enjoys regular engagements with all state and um, region bands and orchestras, as well as university and professional ensembles. Um, he received his bachelor's degree in music from James Madison University and his master's degree from the University of Miami in Florida. Currently, he is director of instrumental publications for the FJH Music Company, who helped us sponsor this event, and assistant director of bands and orchestras at Townsend University. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Welcome, Brian. Hey, thank you. Um, and good morning to all of you. Um, I don't see anybody wearing shorts and short sleeves this morning. Uh, rumor has it that it is a little cooler there than it is here. Um, I told Cindy that's why, unfortunately, I will never live in that part of the country because I think temperatures that cold should be illegal. Uh, but that's just me. Um, it's, it's great to spend some time with you. Uh, and, and it's really important that even before we start this, um, that I want you to understand that, that my intention is not to just sit here and lecture at all of you for an hour. I really enjoy the, uh, the interactive element of this, right? Um, and, and I don't want this to feel like an async kind of thing where it's like, okay, I'm getting back on the computer. So those of you with the videos on, I love it because it helps me read the room, right? It helps me understand the parts that you're connecting with. Um, and, um, and so I wanna make sure that you, know, you, you, you have all of those uh, opportunities. Uh, so yeah, anybody who wants to pop those on, I love it. And I will always, always, uh, you know, kind of focus on you first, right? You get the priority. So anyway, um, and I will take questions as we go, right? So that we have a chance for all of that. Um, as we get started with this, I, I think one of the things that is really important to me to address and kind of the point of today is that, um, we're all, and I should actually take a survey from all of you, for, first of all, and, and that'll help me with the direction of this as well. Um, how many of you are in some element of face-to-face of -face instruction right now? Um, okay. Um, and then how many of you are also either dealing fully online or you're in a hybrid model where you have some kids online? Okay. So we really have a mixture. And it was really funny because yesterday I presented uh, to folks in Canada. Okay. And um, in, in Canada, I had uh, asked the same question. I said, you know, all right, uh, who, uh, who is uh, doing, <laughs> I said, who, who's doing uh, remote and nobody raised their hand. And I was like, wow, it's really that different. It's really that different. Uh, um, so with you all, this is going to be a really nice session because it's really going to show you elements of both. Um, the, the, the issue that we're facing right now, especially right now, is that you all have been trained out the yin yang, right? You have been trained out the wazoo in terms of what technology you have available to you. You can do Zoom to do this. You can use Flipgrid. You can use Cahoots. You can use it. We have all this great technology, right? And that's wonderful. That's wonderful. The problem right now, the problem right now is that nobody has really said, let's address how we're going to keep our kids motivated. And I think that's the problem right now is that everybody here is terrified of saying, okay, I've got kids right now that the, the novelty of all this is really wearing off now and they're wearing down and I got to keep them going. Like I need to have them ready to go next semester. I need to know I'm going to have a program next fall. And so we're talking about how do we retain these kids, but also how do we engage them? How do we motivate them? Right. And, and that's what I want to talk about today. This is the, probably the most important thing that we all need. And it's probably the single most important thing that's kind of not really been addressed is how do we engage these kids and inspire them, knowing that some of them are at home, some of them are in the classroom. Right. And the dynamic of that classroom changes sometimes daily. 
right? I've done this all over the world now. And there are people who have full back instruction. There are some people that one day they have 15 kids in the room and the next day there's an outbreak and they have eight kids. There's another person whose groups have been determined alphabetically by last name, right? Talk about great ensemble diversity right there. Yeah, their ensembles are really well balanced, right? Uh, at least they have an equal balance of last name A and last name B. Right. So so there's there's a real challenge that a lot of us are facing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of share with you a, a couple of things and we'll kind of go through this all together. And hopefully when we're all done this, it'll give you guys a lot of ideas on how to finish not only this semester, but even going into the fall. All right. So hopefully all of you can see this and you can adjust your screens however you want to. Um, I always adjust my screen because I want to make sure that I can see all of you and not just the, the reimagined um, slides. But uh, we're going to talk about engaging your kids in any environment possible. And the first thing I want to talk about is framework. Framework. Um, if you have not read the book, there's a great book by uh, Rosamund Stone Zander and Benjamin Zander. Of course, Benjamin is the uh, conductor of the Boston Philharmonic uh, Orchestra. And Rosamund Stone Zander is a uh, very well-renowned uh, psychologist. And the two of them uh, put together this book. It's a great read. And it's all about the art of possibility. And what the first thing they talk about is framework. They talk about framework. And we all instinctively frame things a certain way, right? And, and we get locked into that framework. It carries everything from the way we view a situation to the way we characterize something like writer's block. And we talk about this wall that we keep running into. The funny thing is the only person that put the wall up is us, but we talk about it. And so the thing is, let's look at the framework. Let's look at the current established framework that the majority of people are, are kind of looking at, right? And so the framework that we're looking at is the bad news, right? We're looking at everything through a bad news framework. What is the bad news? We have smaller classes, right? We have, we have a spaced out smaller classes and most of us are in a hybrid or virtual modality. All right. It's a completely ever changing modality. We're dealing with unusual groupings. I mentioned the alphabetical, right? Sometimes we have a group that someday you show up and you have four oboes and an alto saxophone. Who am I kidding? Nobody's got four oboes. Forget that. Right. And if you do have four oboes, then I'm going to give you, make you host and you can give a master class on how you even did that. Um, but we do have unusual groupings. <laughs> and of course, this idea of over overall uncertainty because every time you think okay i've got a plan i know how i'm going to move forward then the next day comes and that plan is changed and the goalposts keep moving and and how do we create any kind of consistency how do we create any kind of motivation and get our kids in some kind of consistent model and those are what i want to talk about because all of those things under that framework can have a very negative effect on music. So if we can, I would like to change the framework. So here's the funny thing. The good news is that we carry around this framework of assumptions that I've been talking about. And if we change the frame, new possibilities emerge. So really quickly, show of hands, for those of you with cameras off, you can pop your hand up in the, in the uh, responses. But how many of you uh, uh, teach uh, strings in some capacity? Just want to get an idea of that. Okay, so a pretty good number of you. Uh, and then how many of you are, are banned? I assume we've got a decent number of you as well. Yep, okay, so we've got both. And that's good. So I want to be very clear in that um, the, the examples I'm showing you today are going to show equal love between band and strings. Um, String directors know that I love string a lot and band folks know that I love band. And there's a funny story. I was at Midwest one year and, and I was talking to a, a string director and a band person came up and started talking about all this band music that they loved of mine. And the string person so innocently, but real looked at me and said, oh, wow, I didn't know you write band music. And I just thought that was the greatest thing ever in the world because the band director looked at them like, oh, what planet do you live on? Um, but, but that's what I like. That's what, I, that's what I'm all about is, is, is I don't wanna be a band composer. I don't wanna be a string composer. I wanna just be a composer. And, and, and those both groups are treated equally. So we will change both of those groups. So here's what I want to talk about with a framework. The good news is that we do not teach band and orchestra, none of us. 
And you think about that and you think, well, what in the world does that even mean? And I had to back up and think about this a lot before I truly got to a point where I could appreciate this. So what does that even mean? Well, what it means is that we teach music. All of us teach music. And we've got to, first of all, remember that the band and orchestra experience is one vehicle that we use to teach music, but it is not the vehicle, nor is it the only vehicle. It is one of many vehicles. And if we can start to change that framework, that changes the way we can approach everything. And, and, and to put this in perspective, I have actually thought this for a very long time, but I didn't realize it. What does that even mean? I look back at the countless honor bands, the countless orchestras, all of these things that I've conducted over the last many years. And there's one thing that I have said to these kids over and over and over again that I've never thought about in such detail until now. And what do I tell them? I tell them, look, tomorrow's the concert or, or in an hour we've got the concert and that's great, but I don't actually care about the concert. I love the concert and I always tell them I have a love-hate relationship with concerts. I love the concert because it gives us an opportunity to share who we are as a group, as a combined conductor and performer group a concert gives us an opportunity to share who we are it gives us a ch chance to share the relationships that we have formed with each other and it gives us a chance to just kind of show what we do and why but i've never fully loved the concert experience and the reason why is because as soon as i give that first downbeat every subsequent beat is one beat closer to the final cutoff in which, especially in an honor band or an honor orchestra situation, at that final cutoff, that group is gone. That group will never exist again. And we all depart to our own parts of the country, sometimes our own parts of the world. And to me, that's a very finite thing. And I have always chosen to say, you know what? I want to make sure that the journey is more important. I wanna make sure that I am leaving you with these seeds, these elements that will make you grow, that when we are gone, you will not stop growing. And that, when I finally was able to latch on to that, that's when I was able to realize, okay, maybe I'm not doing concerts right now, but I still can instill those moments of growth in these kids. I can still inspire and I can still help them with their creativity. Now, of course, ultimately, we want to get back to large ensembles, and I'm going to promote them. Don't you worry about that, okay? I am out there all the time making sure that every administrator out there knows, and every time I'm doing one of these, an administrator pops off, I stop, and I say, I start talking about it. Don't you worry. I'm out there looking for you. So with this in mind, we are going to talk about solutions, right? We're going to talk about solutions to uncertain instrumentation. Those of you that do have the four oboes and one alto saxophone who are going to have a clinic immediately after this on how to get four oboes ever, right? Um, we're, we're, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about uncertain size of ensemble. How do we maintain consistency when one day you've got 15 kids and then there's an outbreak and the next day you have four and the next day you have nine, right? They have nine, and maybe your four oboes don't show up that day, but your seven bassoon players suddenly show up. <laughs> you see where I'm? See what I did there? Yeah. Okay. Good. And then we're going to talk about: Are we going to? What about in school and remote? How are we going to handle this when your half of your kids are at home, or sometimes all of your kids are at home, and then sometimes all of your kids are going to be back in school? For, but how do we handle that? This ever-changing goalposts keep moving atmosphere. So, in order to do that we need to start reimagining ensembles. Now, the things that I'm gonna share with you today, I do not believe are all temporary solutions. As a matter of fact, uh, a, a very dear friend of mine in Texas, her, her band has played at Midwest several times, um, has said to me, you know, talking about these ideas, this will forever change the way I teach my third band now. I will not teach our third band the same way ever again because of the things that we talked about. It makes so much more sense. So I want us to realize that these are not 
quick fixes, the Band-Aid put on a pandemic, but some of these can be lasting changes that you may implement in your own teaching, all right? Yes, a lot of this we want to go away, but there are some great things that are going to come from this that may have long-lasting impact. All right. And we're going to talk about flexible instrumentation. We're going to talk about ways to harness the creativity of your students. There are things that we're going to talk about today that allow your students to participate in the creative process in ways that they have never been able to participate. I mean, we're talking about adding an element of spontaneity to your rehearsal that has not been there sometimes for decades. It's really exciting. And then for those of you that do have kids at home, those of you that do have kids in a virtual environment, we are going to talk about engaging them through connected learning. I want to be very clear that I stole the phrase connected learning. That is not my idea. I stole it from my son's school, but let me tell you why I love it. We've been emphasizing virtual learning, distance learning, online learning, at home learning, all of those adjectives are enforcing the idea of us being apart and far away. Think about it, distance learning, at home learning. We're, we're reinforcing being apart. But if we start talking about connected learning, now we are reinforcing the way we are connecting with each other. And that is so important. And, and my son's school really got fancy and they capitalized the ed of connect ed. Aha, see, see, they're smart. They're smart. Um, so I invite you to take a similar approach. It really does change the mindset, all right? So one of the things that I'm going to talk about, and this is going to be a jumping off point. We're not gonna only talk about this, but we are going to talk about the Reimagine Initiative. And the Reimagine Initiative is something that came out of my association with the Creative Repertoire Initiative. I'll get into all of that, all right? But this is going to be one vehicle that we're going to use as a jumping point into a lot of different composers, a lot of different products, a lot of different ideas to help you. So what is the Reimagine Initiative? The Reimagine Initiative is something that we're going to talk about that uses adaptable parts, and in our case, fully adaptable parts. And we're going to talk about the difference between fully adaptable and semi-adaptable, full flex, semi-flex. FlexBand is something a lot of you know a lot about, right? It's great for smaller ensembles and it really helps with um, when you have a, a very insecure instrumentation or, or just small group and you wanna make sure you have something that works, but it's not fully flexible, right? What if you have, what if you have a trombone, a low brass ensemble and that's it? In a traditional FlexBand, you can't play that piece because you don't have access to parts one, two, and three, right? So full flex allows you to play a piece of music with any instrumentation possible. If you have four flutes, you can play it, okay? If you have five saxophones, you can play it. If you have finally all 10 of your oboes show up, you can play it, okay? See, I'm, 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 I'm willing this to happen for you all. All right, we're gonna talk about this idea of accompaniment parts the idea of percussion options, multiple percussion options, so that some of you might be able to have more percussions in the room at one time because they can mask, right? So why not be able to use some of these to create full-on percussion ensemble pieces, right? There's a lot of opportunities that we can use way beyond performance. And I wanna talk about that. We're also gonna talk about three and four-part adaptable versions. And why do I say three-part? Well, those of you that are teaching beginners, if we take a four or five part flex model and take it for beginners, the likelihood number one is that you're gonna be lucky to have maybe eight kids in the room, maybe nine, maybe 10. And if you're looking at a five part model, that means that you're gonna have one to two players per part with a beginner, okay? That's not gonna fly. That's not gonna fly. And, and they're not going to be comfortable. If you change this to three part or four part writing, then you can suddenly have at least three or four kids on a part. That's a game changer and y'all know it is, right? Of course you do. And so we're gonna make sure that we're doing that and making sure that all instruments have access to all the parts. Now, this is where the game changer came from my friend in Texas, because you know what she said to me? She said, you know what? This was a game changer. Let's talk about the frame. Let's talk about that framework and go back for a minute. So 
those people that had that original framework that were stuck, they were saying, well, wait a minute, that can't be right. All instruments have access to all parts. Clearly they don't mean the tuba, right? Clearly they don't mean the tuba because it's gonna sound like garbage if you have four tubas playing all the different parts at the same time. So clearly that's not what they mean. And here's the problem. They are stuck on that framework of, I have to perform this stuff and I have to, that is my goal is to perform, my performance goal. And my point is, you've got to reframe what you can do with this. So what can we do with this? Well, what my friend in Texas said, she said, you know, with my third band, what we did was we handed out part one to the entire band. And we learned part one together, which allowed me to make sure that every kid was using the exact same articulation, the exact same note length. They were matching pitch. They were not rushing, right? All of these things that allowed them to suddenly do that they were not able to do otherwise. And then here's the other thing. I believe that we are in the golden age of the low string, low read, low brass player. We are in the golden age. Because if we start harnessing these materials for the first time ever, your tuba players, your double bass players, your bass clarinetists, all of these kids are going to have access to the exact same material that your flute players are going to have, your clarinet players are going to have, your violins are going to have. And we quite possibly can see technique developed at a rate we have never seen before in our, our low voice instruments, who typically have become experts at playing the ever, ever lovely football. Right? And so there's a great opportunity here. And so absolutely, all instruments are going to have access to all the parts. And we'll talk about how we use that. And so she did that. Everybody learned part one. Then everybody learned part two. Then everybody learned part three. And then they start to put it together. Not only does it become amazing when it's put together, but suddenly not only are they able to play it so much better, but they're hyper aware of what everybody else is playing because they've played that part before. So it really increases the ensemble. All right. So a lot of stuff. The other thing I want to talk about is accompaniment, including accompaniment files. And I've been encouraging a lot of composers to do this. All right. Because some of you have kids that are at home, so they don't have access to all that. So how cool is it if they have an accompaniment track that they can play along with? Not only that, but I have seen kids that have been very motivated that are saying, you know what? I've got the accompaniment. I've got all the parts. I'm going to record the whole piece. I'm going to use acapella, or I'm going to use band lab, or I'm going to use audacity or garage band that I'm going to record the whole piece. And then, I mean, what a perfect opportunity for them to realize an entire piece of music. And for some of them, they might share files with a friend and say, I'll, re I'll record parts one and two, you do three and four. So there's a lot of great opportunities here. All right. I also want to talk about going beyond performance, right? Because if we are going to change the framework, and let's go beyond, how about this? We're gonna talk about how students can make orchestration decisions. So let's talk about all of you that have kids coming into your band room and your orchestra room. You're gonna have kids someday, and it's usually gonna be a trumpet player because they're the smart aleck. And how do I know? Because I am a trumpet player and I'm a smart aleck. That's why, by the way, I married a flute player. I married a flute player for stability. I knew that I would have stability. I knew that I would always have pencils in the house and they would always be sharpened. And I knew that I would have great organization in my life, right? Um, and, and boy, did she hold up her end of the deal, okay? And I've held up my obnoxious end of the deal, but she's, she's tamed me, so it's great. But the reality is you're gonna have some trumpet player one day that's gonna say, hey, I know, let's get a tuba and a berry sax on part one and a, a flute on part two and a clarinet on part four. They're gonna say something like that, right? And you're gonna read the piece. Now, there are going to be instances where when you're reading it, it is going to sound awful. It's gonna sound terrible. And that is going to lead into a great discussion about why does it sound so bad? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what orchestration decisions we just made that made it sound so bad. And let's compare it to the normal music that we play. And why does it sound so good? Like what, what, what's the difference, right? But here's the other cool thing. Check this out. 
that obnoxious trumpet player is going to make some obnoxious idea, or maybe your bass player is going to say, I want to play the, the bass line one and put the violins on line four. But somebody's going to make some, what they think is an obnoxious orchestration decision about who's going to play what, and you're going to start to play the piece. And there are going to be instances where everybody says, oh my gosh, that is awesome. Like that sounds incredible. We never knew it. And it's going to sound like a completely new piece of music and you will discover new orchestration opportunities that they never considered before. So imagine what your rehearsals could be like when those kids every day are coming in saying spontaneous Spontaneous. It's going to be spontaneous. We have no idea what it's going to sound like today. We have no idea who's going to play one part. And we have no idea what kind of cool sounds or awful sounds we're going to create today. How awesome. There's a level of spontaneity we are going to bring back to our teaching and to our ensembles. And I think that is going to be an incredible benefit and an incredible gift. How about flipping your band, right? We've always talked about flipping your band, flipping your orchestra. Let's put the basses in the front. We're going to put the violins in the back. We're going to put the tubas in the front and the flutes are going to be in the back and getting that chance to hear them. Well, you know what? Now you don't even have to move. You, now you can just flip their parts and put the flutes on the bass line, put the tubas on the melody line so that they all start to get develop a different understanding of the role of each part and its relationship with each other. And then how about sight reading? All of you wish that you had more opportunities for sight reading. Well, now I'm telling you that with these materials, you can sight read the same piece three or four different times in a row. And every time you are fully sight reading because everybody's playing a different part. So, so there's a lot of great opportunities here. And suddenly when you change your framework, suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, I can do all of this stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff that I can do now that I couldn't do before. And that's what we're trying to get to. So how did I get so excited about this? Because believe me, when this pandemic hit, I was not very excited about anything. Um, show of hands, how many of you heard of the Creative Repertoire Initiative? Okay, so a couple of you have, and a couple of you, a lot of you have not, which is great because I'm here to talk to you about it. So the Creative Repertoire Initiative was originally founded by a conversation between two folks and it was uh, Richard Floyd, a lot of you know from Texas and Alan McMurray, uh, who of course a lot of you know from, um, from Colorado. And they had this discussion and in this discussion, they said, you know, this is back in March. We, we are anticipating the fall. There's gonna be a huge problem where, where ensembles are gonna be distant socially distant. We're going to have issues of different, uh, we don't know how many people are going to be at home. And there's a problem in the curriculum because they're not going to have their curriculum because their curriculum is their music. So what are we going to do? And so McMurray called Frank to Kelly and Richard Floyd called me. And that's how this whole thing got started. And so what the Creative Repertoire Initiative wound up becoming was a collection of composers and conductors who came together with the pure goal of figuring out ways to create new adaptable music that will work as your curriculum, but not just becoming a, a, a dominant market on ourselves, but to inspire countless other composers to do the same. We could have dominated the market, and that was the very last thing that we wanted to do, because the only way we survive this as a musical community is by all hands on deck everybody firing from every cylinder that we've got, okay? And so that's why you can see we were committed to power others. And when I say we didn't want to dominate, well, when you see the list of names, you can see why we were worried about dominating, all right? So this is a very band heavy list of names. So string directors, you're gonna say, well, there's not a lot of string people on here. Don't worry, I got your back, got your back, okay? Um, but they were more worried about the band folks because strings are like, well, you have access to trios and quartets and different things like that. Band, they were like, what? We don't know what we have access to. And so you can see the list of names, right? Uh, Robert Ambrose, Georgia State University. He's kind of like our fearless organizing leader. Great, great individual. Uh, Steve Bryant uh, and Steve and Alex Shapiro both have this great advantage of being able to do electroacoustic music, which means that some of the pieces they have been releasing will work for as little as one player in electronics or a hundred in electronics. Uh, you've got Michael Daugherty, uh, Julie Giroux, Jennifer Jolly, who uh, I, I always say Jennifer Jolly is my best friend that I have never yet met. 
all right? Because everything we've done is on virtual. Everything we've done is through, through Zoom. And I've declared her my best friend who I've ever never actually met in person. Uh, John Mackey's done great stuff. Pete Meekin, uh, Frank DeKelly, Omar Thomas, and, and Eric Whitaker. So as you can imagine, those first few Zoom sessions were pretty fun. Those were pretty fun. Uh, more than anything, though, they were cathartic and they were, they were therapeutic to me because we were all just kind of talking about what are we going to do and how are we going to move forward. And so we decided very very early on, we wanted to become a think tank. We wanted to explore a lot of different compositional approaches. And that included this idea of full adaptable music scoring, music involving improvisation, chants, music with electronics. That's where, uh, again, Steve and Alex really came in. And so a lot of things, we also wanted to make sure that we were advocating. And this was a huge thing. We wanted to inspire other composers and amplify the voices of other composers to create as much of a resource as we can. Speaking of resource, here you go. Write this down, folks, okay? So, so the website, let me, I'm gonna just tell you right now, your go-to is the Facebook group. That is where you want to go, the Facebook group. You can find the Facebook group from our website, which is creativerepertoire.com. And I also want to acknowledge there is a Facebook page, okay? The Facebook page really is the gateway to our group, all right? The group is where all the cool kids are, folks. The page, no cool kids are there. The group is where it is at. So I encourage you to join that. As you join that, you will see there are hundreds upon hundreds of posts from people all over the world posting adaptable music that you can play. Some of it they are giving away way at no charge and some of it obviously people are trying to make a living but there is a large option of stuff out there and i'm going of course going to share some of this with you but that is where you want to be creative repertoire initiative facebook group be cool be cool all the cool people are doing it okay so all right that's where we want to go now all this is well and good but what i really want to do is get into some examples because really this is what you wanna see, right? You wanna know how this works and, and what, it, what it even is, all right? And so we're gonna start off with Blue Ridge Rear, right? And if you don't know it, right? Once I figure out how to get you all so large that I covered up my, uh, there we go. All right, so hopefully you all can hear this. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear this as I start it. But here's the original. And I'll even show you this score. Okay, so a lot of you are like, yeah, I know that. I know that piece, right? It's, it's one of my most popular pieces. So of course, uh, a lot of you know it. Um, so my question to myself was, okay, can I make this an adaptable piece? And the answer was, yeah, absolutely. I know I can make it adaptable. How adaptable? And this is where things get very interesting. So let's look at the instrumentation list here. You're going to see there, it includes parts one, two, three, and four for every instrument. And those of you that teach orchestra or those of you that have string and band at the same time, you'll see there's an alto clef part in there, which means that you can do this with full orchestra if you want to. <clears throat> string people that are doing this and you're gonna look at that and say, well, that's in the key of E flat. I, that's not gonna work for my orchestra. I did a version for you in G, G and going into A. So I got your back. I promise you I got your back, right? So you'll see all of those adaptable parts. Then you're going to see alternate parts, right? We all know that tenor sax and horn do not play nicely with other unison instruments. We know they don't. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we gave alternate parts to those instruments so that it was right in the meat of their register. You're going to see a piano, guitar, accompaniment part. So I always put in a very simple piano part but I also, when I can, put in chord changes because some of you might have a guitar player, 
that can play along or that might be in the class. Some of you might just be able to read core changes yourselves and be able to support them. Um, and again, in addition, we have the MP3, which I'll share with you. And then in this case, you can see there's additional percussion parts. So we all have the adaptable mallet parts, which means that you could do all parts one, two, three, and four with mallets. And then in addition, have a vibraphone part, percussion one and two. So you can have a massive percussion ensemble piece. And there are a lot of people that are trying to figure out what to do with their percussion because they can have a lot of percussions in the room because they can all be masked and they can be a lot closer than their wind players can be. And they're trying to figure out what to do with them all. Well, here's an option, all right? So there's information here about what to do and uh, how to use it. And then if you want to do this in a more traditional route, you'll see there are recommended part assignments for three and four part works. But again, I was asking the question, how ultimately flexible can this be? So let's look at the way this is written. You're going to see parts one, two, three, and four. So I went with the idea of a reduced score. Parts one, two, three three and four, you will notice that part four is a bass clef part. So that is telling you that if you have the luxury of having some kind of balance instrumentation, that part four is going to serve more like the bass line, right? And it's going to be a lower voice, which means that parts one through three could be flute and part four could be a clarinet or parts one through three could be saxophone and part four could be a berry sax, um, trumpet, trombone. Exactly. So you follow what I'm saying. But the question was, what if you don't have the bass voice? Because that was where we come back to. The traditional flex band works great when you have some sort of instrumentation in the low end. What if I'm doing trumpet day and I just have my trumpet ensemble, right? My trumpet section. And the next day I've got my woodwind section. Can this piece exist entirely on its own that way? And so I decided to try it. <laughs> So what I did was I wrote Blue Ridge Reel as a trumpet ensemble piece. So I took that fourth part and I said, you know what? It might be a little bit cross voicing, but I want to make sure that if a trumpet player gets that fourth part, that they can actually play it in the correct octave, right? We don't need to add 12 feet of tubing to the trumpet, um, <clears throat> but I wanted to make sure that it actually would function. And so a lot of you may know Jose Sabaja. Jose is a very good friend of mine. He's the lead trumpet player in the Boston Brass. And uh, I called him up and said, hey, Jose, um, could, you, uh, could you take a look at this and maybe record for me? And he offered to record it. It was great. Um, and so I want you to hear what this sounds like with just four Jose's, right? Four trumpets. And the only other thing you're going to hear is the MP3 that I offered, right? Which is just going to be a little bit of the piano to help for a pitch um, identification for them to stabilize pitch. And then uh, <clears throat> percussion to help with uh, the uh, time. All right, so here this is with just trumpet. have to understand something. When I got this recording back and I listened to it, I burst into this joyous just feeling of realizing, you know what? This is not just a gimmick. Like it it works. And 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 for me, this was like this huge moment of realizing that this can work. Like this can actually function. And people started sending me recordings of their woodwinds out in the parking lots of their schools playing this music with no brass players, and it was working. And I would get a, a kid, one motivated flute player was at home doing, doing connected learning. 
and she decided to record all she recorded using acapella all four parts using the accompaniment track and it worked and and for me this was like we can do this no matter what the world is going to throw at us, we can do this. And if we get back into full ensemble, I can do this with the full ensemble. And if I get back into really full ensemble, I can do the original with them. And all of them will have a much more detailed notion of the piece because they've broken it down like this, right? There is a way forward. For those of you in the string world, yes, it works for strings. Here it is, just the very beginning of it. Matter of fact, I'll play, you for, I'll play the end for you. But the opening is in the key of G with harmonics. I'll jump to the end. It works. It works. And, and actually, that was supposed to be played at Midwest uh, last year until Midwest last year didn't happen, right? But, 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 but somebody felt there was enough worth there to do it. And you know what they were going to do? And here's another thing to think about they were actually going to make it like a section feature. They were gonna open up with the whole group playing and then it was gonna go just the violins for a little bit and then just the violas. Who, who, whoever thought about that, right? Just violas, then suddenly just the cellos. <coughs> and then they were gonna give the basses the melody while the other voices were all playing accompaniment lines. And they were gonna just work it through and, and do with the orchestration. So there's a lot of opportunities here, all right? Um, let's look at some other music real, real quick. I'm going to show you two other string pieces, and then we're going to dive into the world of band. And so Viking, uh, and this is a piece by Soon-He, and you're going to see this is a little bit of a different score presentation, and I want to show you why. So with Soon-He, one of the things that she really realized was that she said, look, look at measure five right here. These open double stops are easy on violin, and she wanted to be able to use those. However, they're not easy on bass and they're not easy on cello and viola. So she wanted to make sure that she could absolutely maximize her use of every instrument, which means that yes, viola and cello have that low C string and they can do the open, open double stops down there, but violin cannot. So she wanted to maximize what she could do with every voice. So again, you can do this with four violins and you can do it with four cellos, but here's what it sounds like. Again, it works. And then there's another great version and I'll show you one more. I'm just kind of letting you guys take a quick look at the score, but it's all very, very playable and it works. But then here's the finale from Serenade for Strings. And look at this, this is in three part. Again, for a younger piece, it's a younger piece. And so even this will sound good and I'll kind of jump you into the faster part here. Again, notice there what we did again was this idea of being three part for a younger group. All right. So the first thing is I want to make sure that you all realize that this there, there's about 23 of these now in the creative uh, in the uh, uh, reimagine initiative. You can find all of these and West Music can get you any of them. And if there's anything they don't have, I will personally guarantee that I will figure out a way to get it to them fast. Okay. And that includes digital access. So if you need a digital access, you can go through West. And again, I will take care of it. I will take care of it. The folks at West, I told them that their organization has blown me away. The way they prepared for this, the way they have organized this, it has literally blown me away. And I promise you, I will do everything in my power to match the kind of customer service and the kind of approach to this that they have taken. Um, I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to match what they've done, but I'm gonna try. All right. So anything that you want on that list, it's well, you can get it through them. All right. And that's fghmusic.com slash adapt. And you can find all of that there. 
All right. All of that will be there. So again, that is fjhmusic.com slash adapt. And anything that you see there, you will be able to get through West Music. And I've mentioned there's 23 pieces there now at a variety of grade levels for band and strings. Um, what I want to do is share with you a couple other things. And I'm going to go as fast as I can because I got a lot of things that I want to go through, but I want to share it with you. And so the first one we're going to jump into is John Mackey. So a lot of you are like, man, I really wish I could have done the music of John. Well, the funny thing is John was in a hole when this whole thing happened. And after our CRI meetings, Creative Repertory Initiative, John got really excited and started working on a piece of music until he suddenly thought he was plagiarizing Frank to Kelly. And so he wrote Frank and he said, Frank, I think I'm, I think I'm ripping you off. And Frank listened to it and he goes, no, I don't think you are. And so John decided, well, I can't quite let go with it. And so you can see the title he gave it, right? Let me be frank with you. Um, but this is a little bit of this piece. And I want you to hear what he's able to do with just four part writing and drum set. I did ask John, because right now this is semi-flex. That D part is required to be a bass voice. But John recorded that as part of the MP3. So if you don't have the bass voice, they should still be able to do it. But listen to this. It still sounds like John. It's fun. It's really fun. And, and, and I think it's a great thing to get your kids really excited about. Uh, and so that is let me be frank with you. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit here into a piece by Omar Thomas. If you don't know Omar Thomas, you need to. Omar Thomas is um, a, a really bright, shining voice. I, I would say he's a new voice, but he's not a new any voice anymore. Um, this is a piece that uses elements of improvisation. He calls it sharp nine because of the chord structure. I begged him to call it hashtag nine, but he wouldn't. So whatever. It was my, I, I thought it was brilliant, but he didn't. Um, but listen to what he does here. And he concludes a, a lot of uh, supplemental materials in terms of uh, how to research this. He talks about listening things that you can talk about, um, uh, uh, past listening, suggested listening, a historical perspective. There's a lot of great things in here, but here's a little bit of sharp nine. So really fun, really, really fun. And so um, there's a lot of great things in there as well. Um, next, let's move on to arithmetic number one. Here's one of the pieces that is available in the Reimagine Initiative, uh, if you take a look. Um, string folks, you're gonna see that it says B flat instruments. Again, there is a string specific version for this in a string friendly key. Although again, you could do this with full orchestra if you wanted to. Uh, how many of you know the Terry Riley in C that was done in the 60s? Some of you do. And this was a cellular piece. So Frank DeKelly actually did a, a version of this called NC Dorian. Um, and that inspired me to do this arithmetic number one. And what it is, is this now allows kids to be a part of the development of a piece, which is unheard of. It's amazing. And so I give them section one, right? They start with cell one. Some kids will start cell one. Some kids are gonna wait a little bit before they do cell one. And then some kids after a while will jump into cell two. Some might hang back on cell one. Some kids might still be resting and come in on cell one later. Some kids might jump into cell five for a couple of moments and then jump back to cell three. And then they're foreshadowing, right? That's foreshadowing what's to come. But they might decide that they're going to do that. And then some kids might jump down here into cell nine for a little bit and then jump back up. They're allowed to do anything they want, jumping ahead, jumping back, progressively working through, but they're not allowed to move into section two until you give a cue and then they're in section two and then you'll see there's a section three and then four and five and let me let you listen to just a little bit of what this sounds like
and the kids can make the decisions on this. They can decide who's going to do what. Hey, let's have Tudis come first. And let me jump to the end here a little bit. Right now we're about cell 35. idea right but there's a lot of opportunity right there as well so again that's available for band or string but it gives them a chance to be involved right um jennifer jolly uh, as i said she's a great friend this piece is the only one that i know that really can be quite successfully performed in a virtual environment over zoom all right and the funny thing is she wrote this years before covid um, and what she does is she creates indeterminate rhythmic patterns that kids follow, and then she gives them a series of scales, right? Ryo, Ritsu, Yo, these are all based on um, Far East scales. And uh, so there's some really interesting things in here. This performance can last four minutes. It can last 14 minutes. And there's a great recording that she posted of, of a clarinet ensemble. I'll just post a little bit in the middle here. As this is going right, it is progressively getting higher and higher and higher. Um, and so it's pretty interesting, but then um, it starts to go fade to nothing. Um, and so this can be as, as, as dissonant or consonant as the kids decide they want it to be, right? But that's another option. Now, very quickly in the time we have left is uh, Alex Shapiro. A lot of us know Alex Shapiro for her wonderful electroacoustic writing. Well. One of the things that Alex did, which I really love, is she created this piece, Passages. And you'll notice that there are different lines of different levels, right? So some of these lines are, are, are quite a bit difficult. And then there's other lines, like line seven, or even uh, um, line, well, certainly line five, right? Uh, and, and line 11, which could be done by a percussionist who might only have found sounds, right? And so she gives you a recipe, this little game rules that you have to follow. Uh, but here's a little bit of this, and then I'm going to share with you the direction you can go in with this. a smaller group in a concert something like that right you can have as many as again 50 players you could have two or three players all right this led me into this idea of a little matrix music so alex did a a thing with uh, tim salzman in uh in uh university of washington and the big thing was okay we have all these kids at home but we still would love to give them an ensemble experience, a collaborative experience. The virtual ensembles, we agree, are all great, but there's no collaboration. They all play and they upload it, and that's it. We created this curriculum that you can access for free. So if you go to my website, you'll find it. It's brianbelmages.com, and, and specifically brianbelmages.com slash matrix music. But that'll give you a link to this, and you can download her curriculum for free. All right. But the curriculum kind of is a guideline for ways for these kids to collaborate, to record, to upload, and to create their own pieces, their own recordings. And so what I did was I took it a step further and I said, all right, we're gonna create something for younger players. We're going to give them this foundation, this idea of a drone, all right, that they can play along with, and then they can choose different 
different rhythmic cells that they might want to record. They can choose various motifs. They may decide that they're going to pick the first motif, number six, and then they can use melody number 10 that is an extension of that motif. Then they might decide they want to record a counter melody based on that melody. They might want to add different melodic elements, okay? Here's a middle school kid that decided to take this, and I want you to hear a little bit of what they did. that these kids were able to do. Um, and, and so we've seen kids also kind of hang out on this very last page where they have been able to completely improvise and make up everything on their own. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of kids that are doing that. They're collaborating. They're saying, hey, we're all going to do something that's angry or we're all going to do something that's happy and we're going to try to collaborate. Then, hey, can you record this for me and download? There's a whole curriculum on this. And it's something that has been really inspiring for them. All right. Uh, very quickly, the other quick things that I want to share with you, uh, and then I'll take some questions. And, and of course, we're, it looks like we're slightly over, and that's my fault. But um, if there are questions, I will take them. All right. You guys have been awesome, and I want to make sure we have that chance. Um, the other thing that I want to share with you um, are another fun opportunity for these kids if they want to have a chance to do some home practice and some other things. So let me pull this up here. All right. Awesome. Here we are. And that is a book that I did called That's My Jam. You know, we, we want kids to still get technique practice, right? And so I really thought it would be great for kids to have access to these different kinds of tunes uh, and, and scales and patterns, but I wanted them to really have something that's fun. So let's jump into concert F major here. And I want you to listen to a little bit of the background track that we created for the third uh, example here for chromatics. Check this out. fun right it's really really fun and, and here's another one for you right and one more there's just so much fun i love these So this is really fun stuff, right? And of course, the kids can can download these accompaniment tracks for free and everything. But um, it's called That's My Jam. Uh, and, and it's a really fun resource as well. Um, and then the final resource that I would mention to you very quickly is uh, as a resource. Let me see if I can pull this up. Um, and it is Count Me In. Uh, some of you may know Count Me In. Uh, Count Me In is a great resource for your kids when they are at home or even in school and you want to get them into counting. Counting was developed by Darcy Williams. Um, she is a master teacher in Texas and she's helped me create all of these different things that's part of her Teaching Rhythm Logically series. You will notice that uh, every one of these, there's a very specific counting system in the way she has them write, right? You'll see that she has them cross out and do uh, kind of high numbers when they're rest so that kids are used to putting those in. But then she also has bonus games where the kids will count every exercise without stopping. She will have them do this first measure going all the way down. She will have them zigzag where they count this way and then they work their way backward and they go this and the kids can do it. 
the kids can do it. And it really helps their counting. Um, she will do speed band where she will keep increasing the speed of the metronome. And as you make a mistake, you're out and you wait and see who the last person is left standing. Um, and then we included duets and trios. And so these can be with found percussion, right? These can be just kids at home doing these even. Uh, but th this is all options with found percussion or if maybe you're not allowed to have instruments in band at the moment, you can do those things. And we go through a whole series of things and I'll just show you mixed meter, uh, eighth notes. Uh, we go through eighth rests, okay, ties, dotted quarter notes. Let me go through even a little bit more. Um, 16th notes and we even do mixed 16th notes. And then I'm, I'm sorry, I'm giving you all a headache by going through so fast. Uh, we do do some stuff on cut time, all right? And then uh, again, the ensembles, but then we also do six, eight time. And I thought it was very important to not only do, by the way, she does three, la, li, four. It's a very specific counting system that she uses, but she does say the best counting system is the one that you use every day. Uh, and then finally, we do get into advanced mixed meter. And that's because a lot of these kids never get a chance to actually rehearse and learn how this works. And so we do get into all of that. Uh, and so they get a chance to explore some of that and then irregular meter as well. Okay, so that is a bit of thing uh, that of things that you have a chance to work on with as well to keep your kids engaged and busy. But um, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, it's a whole lot of stuff. But again, the idea here is that we have resources available to us and there are ways forward and there are wonderfully engaging, inspiring ways forward. And I'm hoping that I've kind of given you some idea of what you can utilize for the rest of this semester to keep these kids engaged, to keep them getting involved in new projects, new ideas, new fun ways to keep them going so that by the time we get to the fall, we have kids that are ready to come back, right? Um, I will take questions, uh, and I don't know if, if anybody has uh, uh, questions about different things or about the function of any of the things that I've, I've talked about, but um, there's, there's few enough uh, thus that you can just unmute if you do have a question, and, and I'm happy to answer it, uh, but if not, then we're good, so tell me. Anybody have any questions? I crushed it then, huh? I crushed it. You can also tap into the chat if you have any questions, but um, this looks great. And uh, yeah, this uh, I love the comments that I'm seeing, right? People are like, I can do this, right? I'm down to this, I'm down to that, we can do this. Absolutely, we can. We really, really can. Um, I want to take a moment again and thank the folks at West Music. I, 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 I so sincerely meant what I said about the organization, about um, the way that, that they have handled this from the very first moment to the last. And I do want to point out something that's really important to me. Um, we all know that there are a lot of really huge sheet music distributors out there. Okay, I get it. They're out there and um, they certainly serve a role. However, I want to remind you uh, that the smaller ones, the local ones, those are the groups that are in your band and orchestra halls servicing your broken instruments. They're the ones that are bringing you the, the, the bass drum when your bass drum's broke and they're running one over there to you. When you have a string that broke and you're panicking, they're the ones that are bringing you replacement instruments. They're the ones that are taking hours out to come fix the different things. And when you don't have time to deal with it, they're the ones recommending music to you. They're the ones that are, are bringing the music to you in person so you don't have to pay for shipping. Like the, the, the service that, that these, these local community stores do is invaluable. Um, and, and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to me to make sure that we're supporting the work that they do um, because they're, they're amazing. They truly, truly are. Um, and, and so I, it was really important to me to thank them for all of the work that they've done because um, you, you guys really, you got your stuff together. Um, and and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that you, you run a tight ship. So hopefully I've matched the tightness of ship running that you all do. All right. So huge thank you to West Music for all of this. And uh, I don't know if there's any questions, but if there are. Well, I have a special deal to um, provide to everyone. Um, we are offering 10% off of any of the reimagined initiative pieces. So um, for all of you that attended today, 
Um, if you're serviced by one of our um, local reps, just mention that to them and they will take care of it. If you are not, um, you can use the code FLEX10 at checkout at westmusic.com to get that deal. I'm going to put the details in the chat, but you can also um, um, just reach out to myself, my contact information I'll put in the chat as well, or anyone at West Music, and we will take care of you. Um, so if you go to westmusic.com slash reimagine, that will take you to um, all the pieces that Brian featured today. Oh, perfect. If there's something on there that you don't see, um, we will still definitely get it for you. Um, and the promo code is FLEX10. Um, and let me so, be very clear. So I also put the FJH link in there. Yep. Okay. But let's be, I want to be very clear. There is, there are buy buttons on the FJH page. They do not have the 10% discount. Okay. So do this through West. You can look at the fjhmusic.com slash adapt to hear the pieces and see them. If you don't see them on the West music page, but the West music page is where you get your 10% discount. Yep, and uh, look cool. for a follow-up email as well with the recording of this session, um, as well as I will include the deal um, in that communication as well, because um, there were several that registered today that weren't able to um, attend in person. So we will definitely be sharing all of this information with you um, early next week. Perfect. And you're the host again, Cindy. You've done such a great job that I made you the host again. Oh, thanks. <laughs> So right, well, if there's well, no other questions, folks, yeah. I, again, I'll, I'll stick around for a minute or two if anybody does have any questions. But other than that, I think we're good. And I appreciate you guys coming today. I did just get to um, ask about when the deal expires. It does expire two weeks from today. So you have until Saturday the 27th to take advantage of that 10% deal. That means that since there's 20 some pieces, yeah, you, can, you can spread it out and buy two pieces a day for two weeks. It's true. But right. only because, but only because I love you guys. That's the only reason that you're, I'm allowing that. All right. Well, thanks again, Brian, for um, being here today, and thank you everyone for attending. We hope you found some really good pieces of information to use in your groups. And um, best of luck for the end of this school year, everyone. And y'all take you very care. Much, Brian. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the work you guys put into this. Absolutely. This is the part of the presentation that I need a Benadryl, like when everybody's like leaving and it's just. <laughs> Brian, could I mention something to you? Please. Yeah, you have time. <clears throat> um, I understand the point of the clinic today and I appreciate the work that you're doing as far as FlexBand and I'm very delighted to see many other publishers following suit, including mm -hmm. European publishers, quite a few offering uh, flex. However, I don't think that this is something that we're not talking about. You asserted at the beginning that people seem to be missing the framework. I'd have to disagree with that. I, I think that they do see that framework. And frankly, there's something a lot more profound that, and not to denigrate what you're saying in any no, way. No, not at all, I'm curious. Are. Um, I had a number of epiphanies in the last year that really hit me hard. Um, before the pandemic hit, uh, when my daughters were teenagers and they're both in band and they're both all state musicians, very fine musicians, proud of, proud of them, love them, of course. And one summer, uh, they were lounging around doing nothing. And I thought, well, let's get together as a, as a family band and play something. I said, let's, let's play. Nah. What do you mean, nah? That's school stuff. Oh my God. They didn't want to play because it had the stink of school on it. I thought, what have I done? At the end of every year when the concerts and the contests are all over, a lot of people despair. What am I going to do for these last few weeks of school? I like that because I'll bring out stuff to sight read just for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. And so I'll bring out music and the students see this new music on the stands. We have three weeks left of school. They say, what's this for? I said, it's for fun. They said, for fun? Again, oh my God, what have I done? 
I asked the high school band director when I was first hired here many years ago, what 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 skills do you want? What scales do you want? Uh, what uh, rhythmic patterns? Uh, he said, just send me kids that love to play. Just send me kids that love to play. And the pandemic has forced a reevaluation of priorities. A lot of people who were very contest festival oriented. Now they don't have those contests. They don't have those festivals. And it's forcing a reevaluation of priorities. Uh, here in Northeast Iowa, uh, we have a number of committees on the Northeast Iowa Bandmasters Association. This is typical for most associations of uh, music teachers. Uh, I'm on research and development. And uh, so I, I had a very simple survey because I hate surveys. And I don't have time for them. And they're usually stupid with so what information. And so I just had uh, four questions. I brought it up here. I thought maybe I'd lost it, but here it is. It's just for this last December. Uh, has the pandemic caused a significant drop in your band program's enrollment? High school? No. Interestingly enough, high school? No, not in Northeast Iowa. Elementary school? Anywhere from no to 100% because they did away with the program. So it's going to knock out the overall program below the knees in a few years because we're not seeing the drop at the high end, but yes, at the low end. If the answer to number one is yes, what percentage have you lost? And again, that goes from like 30% to 50%. Here's where it gets interesting. Other than the impact on enrollment, what other negative effects has the pandemic had on your program? And number four, have you experienced any silver linings? There are more than twice as many silver linings as there are uh, bad things that have happened. I thought that was very interesting. However, this is not to suggest that the pandemic has been a good thing. That's a little bit like saying, hey, in the middle of a war, I found my long lost brother. Well, that's nice, but there was a war. So you can't really compare good things and bad things, but rather I attribute the good things that we found to the resourcefulness of our music teachers who are determined to find positive things out of any set of adverse circumstances. If you are interested, I'd be happy to forward this to you as just a vignette or a snapshot of what's going on in Northeast Iowa as far as the positives and the negatives. But what's really happened that I think is a, a, an epiphany or a seismic change is that people are re-examining their priorities. And and I keep seeing all of these betting, sports betting ads on TV. I don't know, does somebody pass a law? I'm seeing constant sports betting ads on TV to make the game more interesting. Well, I see that a lot of people who are in the music business, they uh, music teaching, uh, they feel that they need to have a competition to make the job more interesting. Really? Interesting for the kids or interesting for you. And now that they don't have those competitions anymore, I notice that a lot of people are going to fundamentals. You've, you've adjudicated, you've seen festivals, and time and time and again, I hear the judges saying, your music, you're picking music that's too hard, you need to pull in your horns, you need to work on your fundamentals, guess what's happening now? They're pulling in their horns, they're playing easier music because they don't have the opportunities for the large, ensemble, large ensembles, and they're concentrating more on fundamentals. I suspect that next year when we achieve hopefully some measure of normalcy, that we're thinking more in terms of fundamentals, we're thinking more in terms of what's really important, and we're thinking more in terms of why are kids really in band? Because I sent out some emails last March when this hit, and we were all shut down, and I invited people to just engage in things that were fun crickets. And and I had 100% retention last year for the first time in my, in my career. Nobody moved away. Nobody quit. I had 100% retention. And yet, and I was thinking, I'm Joe, band director. Man, I've got it together. The kids love band. And yet, when I suggested some of these fun things to do over the internet, crickets, nothing. Why? 
because what they really wanted to do is get together with their friends. That social emotional aspect that has been emphasized by a lot of the organizations online, that was missing. And a lot of organizations uh, of which you are a member and of which you have been uh, promoting, they have been promoting the social emotional aspect of it. And people are beginning to realize, man, this, this is huge. Maybe the kids are in it only so that they can be with their friends. But you know what? I don't care. I don't care what the hook is because good music eventually wins out. And eventually they wake up one day and go, Ding, hey, this music thing is pretty good. But if they joined big band because the, the, the instrument was pretty or their friends were in it, that's okay. Good music eventually wins out. So to put a, a bow on it, it's forcing a reevaluation. People are getting back to the basics and we're starting to ask the harder question, why is a kid really in band? What really keeps them in there? Now, the materials that you presented today, big help, absolutely, for those people who are still involved in some kind of face-to-face -face instruction. But I think the deeper, um, and again, not to denigrate what you're doing at all, I, I deeply admire what you're doing, and I'm grateful for it. But, but these reevaluations of our priorities, the pandemic has really taken our head and shoved our face in and say, man, you need to take a look at where your soul is. No, those are all good questions. I mean, I, I, I certainly have friends all over the world and, and, and um, you know, Northeast Iowa is, is obviously a, um, um, one snapshot of things. Uh, um, I've been talking to friends of mine in all over Texas, California, Alabama, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina. Carolina, up in the Northeast, up in Canada, down in Australia, over in Italy. Um, so I, I've really gotten a, a global picture of all this. And some of the things you're saying are absolutely true. And some of the things are rather unique uh, to, to, to the Northeast Iowa. And, that, and that's, and again, they're all different places. And we've got to address the kids' needs from all And over. I'm from California, so <laughs> I've taught there too. Sure. And it's and a completely so I think different, the, different world. Completely yeah, it's all world. different world, but I think that really at the end of the day, that what we're trying to do, and, and we all agree on this, is we are trying to connect with the kids. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and and I do believe that we need to connect with the band directors too, because I will tell you this, I'm seeing band directors and, and all over. Um, uh, I know, well, I know a lot of band directors, right? <laughs> uh, and orchestra directors, and, and I know uh, a lot of okay band directors and orchestra directors, and I know some of the best band and orchestra programs in, in the world. And um, all of them have come up with ways of making band incredibly engaging and fun, and kids are doing it, and the kids love it, and they're doing scavenger hunts, and they're doing everything. Like, it's, it's really great. And they're doing a lot of fundamental work, but those same band directors are then, uh, every couple of weeks, just posting and being like, I'm done. I'm done with this. I hate it. I want full band. I want my kids back. I want that. And and I think it's just important that we're addressing the emotional health. And and, and sometimes sometimes we're not going to be able to do fundamentals. Sometimes we just need to have fun. And sometimes these kids just need to, I mean, that's just going to be what we have to do. Um, and yes, in the fall, we're going to put our nose back to it and we're going to do what we can. But the fall is not going to be a walk in the park either. Fall is going to be a challenge in itself. But, um, but there's a lot of great comments and I think it's important. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, Keith, I saw your comment in here about the, the rise of the bladesmith. And um, the, the answer to that is, is simply that, um, you know, these kids, uh, when, when I wrote that, it was just, it was all imagery. It was imagery of this like master craftsman fire, you know, fire just coming off of the blade and, and, and um, almost like the, the rings of mortar kind of thing. And then just, just fire and brimstone. And, and I really wanted to create something that, that was really powerful, really dark. Um, and, and there's that DS era in there to kind of uh, augment all of that. But I wanted to create something that felt very programmatic, um, even though it was easy to play. I wanted that darkness to be in there, that fire and brimstone. Cool, they'll, they'll love hearing that. I, I really appreciate it. They, they're really digging into it and, and you see all their little toes happen and um it it has uh struck a chord with them so yeah speak. that's good and then just throw lava at them and that will really take it to another level uh programmatically 
<laughs> Which one? I said, just throw bits of lava at them if you can. Oh, right? uh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's some guy on Mr. Beast on, on YouTube that, that has done that before with lava. So you just get some from him and throw it at them and, and that'll increase the, the intensity of the piece a little bit. Perfect. Yeah, okay. just don't use the nice instruments back there. So awesome. Thank you. Cool. Well, you for, hey, it's uh, been great. Thank you for trading over um, Colliding Visions. That, that's been on a lot of honor band programs uh, in this area. And when you came out with the Flex version, got it right away. Kids love it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of those that I'm trying to do. Right? I'm trying to focus on the ones that people already might have and, and want to learn it in a different way. Um, and we're seeing chamber groups doing it. Some people are taking it to festival. The ones that are, they're doing, they're doing uh, some kind of festival, on, whether they're pre-recording or whatever. Um, and then the band directors are planning on playing the full band version next fall. So, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of ways to, to use all this, but uh, my pleasure. Um, uh, Atsuko, you, you, I, I'm assuming I'm saying your name, right? Is it right? Atsuko? Yeah, you said it right. Hi. <laughs> okay, you're surprised. Okay, um, um, you know my advice to, for up and coming composers. You know, I still consider myself an up and coming composer uh, as well. Uh, just kind of growing, <laughs> but um, the, the answer is simply that um, I always encourage people number one to write for what you have access to and what you know. Um, and so uh, sometimes it's sort of like when I started. I was a trumpet player and uh, a good friend of mine was a trumpet player. So I wrote a piece for two trumpets or trumpet ensemble. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it was like, well, I feel more comfortable writing digitally and, you know, in software samples. So I would do a little bit of that. Um, and then I was in a brass quintet. So I would write for them. Uh, and then I was in the band and I wrote for them and I was in the orchestra and I wrote for them. Um, and, and some of the things that I wrote were terrible. Some of them that were absolutely terrible, but I learned a lot from those terrible pieces and I learned what not to do and that helped me kind of reframe what to do. Um, and then the other big help for me was um, getting scores to pieces that I really loved and listening to recordings while watching those scores. To be clear, I do not have a composition degree nor have I ever studied composition formally at all, never. Um, I wow. just written, yeah, I never, I do not have a comp degree. Um, and, and ironic, I don't have a conducting degree either um, nor do I have an ed degree. Um, I was a music industry major. I was already writing music. I wanted to learn how to record it. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but I'm, I, I just learned by doing. Uh, and, and scores, studying was huge for me. Just, just getting Mahler symphony scores, um, going on that IM, uh, you know, I, IMSLP, go, going on that and, and, and downloading and then going on to Spotify or whatever and listening and watching the score. It's huge. It's still huge for me. <laughs> Wow, well, thank you. Um, I'm not a composer myself, or not so much, but my partner is, and uh, um, I'm, I'm a public school teacher, so he's been really helping me out. I would be like, yeah, I really need an orchestra piece, and he would just kind of write something up for mm -hmm. me, and he's been having to expand partially because, you know, I've been doing band and orchestra related things, and um, he probably doesn't want me to say this, but he is really trying to get his music out there and trying to, I guess, create a more of a, not necessarily a brand, but something for people to know him by. And I was kind of wondering if you have any advices for composers to keep feeling motivated to keep going until like they can make a real career out of it and things yeah, like that's that. A challenge. And that's the, the biggest challenge is right now. Right? <laughs> right now, staying motivated is really hard. I mean, I am a full-time composer and a conductor with no groups to conduct for about a year now. Like I haven't stepped on the podium in almost a year and it will be until April that I step onto a podium for the first time again. And believe me, when that happens, I'm probably going to cry my brain out when I, when I hear a tuning note. Um, but um, so motivation is a, is a huge thing. And, and I think you start to realize the difference between internal and external motivation. Um, and, and the external motivation is everybody saying, oh, wow, you're so great and everything. But when, when you're not getting that, especially right now, um, mm -hmm. it becomes much more of an internal motivation. And, and you start to realize how bright is that fire in you? How bad do you want it? Um, how creative can you be right now? Um, and so I think the big thing right, right now is to make sure, uh, obviously, write, right? Have a product, have something out there. And then um, share it with as many people as possible that, um, you know, if, if he's doing any kind of adaptive 
acceptable music, have him post it on the creative repertoire Facebook group. Um, that is a huge thing. People all over the world are doing it and, and it would be perfectly acceptable for him to do that. Um, and so that's one way for people to start recognizing that kind of thing. Um, and then again, you know, um, um, it's getting maybe saying offering, hey, I'll do a Zoom clinic with your group. If you want to do it, I'll do a Zoom clinic with your students. Um, and, and present about the piece. And then next thing you know, and this is what happened with me, somebody says, hey, I heard that um, you presented to, to that band. I would love to do that. And can you present to my band? And, and that's how uh -huh. it ha all happens. And it starts to grow. And so do, do not, you know, social media and word of mouth, they're big things, right? They really, really are. I mean, that's how John Mackey emerged. John Mackey blew up through his use of social media. It's what he's done. Um, uh -huh. And he's done it really, really well right um and and so um he uses social media a lot i certainly use social media a lot um but those are all options and those are the ways forward that i would suggest wow thank you so much i really appreciate that absolutely absolutely <laughs> well thank you so much yeah You're have welcome. a great rest of your day and everything i will i will and i hope all of you guys um just have a, a wonderful day um i hope that this has been helpful and uh Look forward to seeing you all in person in the not so distant future. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cindy, Marcia, um, I, you know, thank you guys so much for, for your work with all of this and uh, hopefully uh, this made an impact. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, let's all go out there and enjoy the negative five degree weather. <laughs> yes. I don't think so. you can enjoy it, but we'll try. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, all right. I will see you all later. And again, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Bye. day. Bye.